just uh, housekeeping rules. Do you want to be interrupted or maybe it's better to have because feel free, it's... Yeah, feel free to interrupt and stop me. You can also ask at, at the end of the presentation. It's no, no uh, strict rules. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so okay. inviting me. Um, as Kata said, uh, here we are working mainly on uh, math, developing machine learning methods for analysis uh, of complex systems. What we say, uh, what we mean when we say complex systems, complex systems uh, uh, that have uh, structured outputs. So where uh, the, the, the prediction problem is not just uh, with a single target and a complex system in terms of uh, dynamics. Also, we have a, a large, large portfolio of applications in life sciences, in engineering, in environmental sciences also. Uh, here, uh, here uh, in this talk, I'll be talking about um, machine learning for space research and more specifically about the problem of modeling thermal power consumption of the mass express spacecraft. Now there are some words here that, that, that may sound strange, but uh, everything will be clear in the next uh, couple of slides. First of all, why, why we are doing all of this? One of the biggest reasons are these. These are uh, images captured by the Mars Express or MAX spacecraft uh, that is operated by the Sp uh, European Space Agency. And is, these images are uh, breathtaking and astonishing. On the upper right is the Korolev uh, uh, crater, and uh, uh, that is uh, like a basin filled with uh, uh, ice water. So, uh, yeah, always when I see these images, uh, I'm, I'm left uh, speechless because this is uh, amazing. Now, not not only that uh, Mars Express takes lovely pictures of, of Mars, it has seven different uh, uh, instruments on board that measure uh, a variety of uh, aspects of the, of the planet. Uh, the images that we're seeing are from the high resolution camera, but also you have a radar, you have a, a spectrometry and so forth and so on. Mars Express was launched in late 2003, so its operation started in 2004, some early 2004, and it was planned to be op in operation for only one Martian year, that is approximately two Earth years, but uh, the, the spacecraft is still operational because of its uh, high relevance and high success. It keeps on giving and giving in terms of scientific return. And from the start of its, its operation phase, it uh, made very, very uh, important scientific breakthroughs. Uh, first in the early 2004, so immediately after becoming operational, uh, in January actually 2004, ESA announced that Mars Express discovered water ice in the South Polar Ice Cap. A month or two after that, Mars Express was uh, discovered met methane in the Martian atmosphere. Although in very small uh, uh, dosages, but methane is very important because uh, Martian atmosphere cannot keep it. That means that something is producing it. Later on, they also uh, discovered spectral signatures of uh, compound ammonia, of the compound ammonia, which is also related to presence of life. During the years, it, it provided a uh, near complete topological map of Mars surface. It assists other missions, other, uh, other missions either from ESA or uh, the Chapelle mission from, from, uh, from the Chapelle mission from ESA or other missions uh, from NASA. And recently in 2018, it discovered that um, there is a subglacial lake very near to the South Polar Cap. Subglacial lake, that means liquid water under the glacier. And this is uh, amazing uh, and, and, and breathtaking. Uh, now we're talking about 
thermal power control and regulation at the spacecraft. I mean, why and what, what does it mean and why it is of so importance? Because there in the harsh environment of the uh, outer space, you can get easily very hot if you're uh, pointing towards the sun or you can get very uh, cold very easily. And now balancing be between these two, it's non-trivial task. Why, why we need to balance? Well, the onboard uh, uh, instruments operate at a different uh, temperature ranges. If you have the camera, for instance, operates in 10 to 20 degrees centigrade, which is like uh, room temperature. But the other, uh, there are other, infra, for instance, infrared scanners that work in very cold temperatures. So different parts of the spacecraft need to be warmed up to different temperatures, depending on uh, the scientific experiment that is being planned and carried out. This, this takes enormous amount of planning in order to be able to preserve mass expresses energy and not to completely deplete its, uh, its uh, reserves. What are the biggest challenges and what influences this uh, uh, process of thermal power control is that, I mean, Mars Max is out there. Uh, you can't get it back. You can't uh, 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 do anything physically to fix it. You can only interact with it remotely. So the equipment is aging. Remember that uh, MAX was launched 2003, so the equipment that was on board there, it's now at least uh, 17 years old. Remember the, how the um, cell phones looked like 17 years old, uh, 17, 17 years ago? So that is the kind of equipment that uh, it's on board MAX. And that equipment is aging. And then, as I said, the space environment itself poses uh, uh, large challenges. So you can have uh, space debris, uh, some comets, space, other space, uh, space bodies that uh, fly past through uh, uh, near. And then the notion of hot and cold here, it's taken to, taken to, to the extreme definitions of these words. Thermally uh, wise, uh, Mars Express has uh, insulation so it's protected from the uh, outside temperatures and it's heated by the uh, uh, solar radiation uh, it, it's a uh, thermal it's its power gets from uh, comes from uh, uh, thermal uh, from sun radiation from the sun and the internal temperature of the satellite is maintained by uh, a series of uh, electrical heaters there are uh, 33 uh, of them that uh, turn on and uh, off depending on, on, the, uh, on the planned uh, uh, experiment to be carried out. Note that, that also the experiments while, uh, perform, uh, while working, so while they're on, they also generate heat and one needs to take that into account. So as I said, Mars Express gets its uh, power from the solar arrays, which is stored in batteries. Uh, this is especially important because uh, batteries uh, have a decay age. Now, why this, this thermal power consumption is like a balancing act? You need to balance from all these conditions that I've discussed and to take them into account and to properly estimate how much thermal power we, uh, will be needed to create the optimal conditions for a given set, for a given instrument to work. In a nutshell, this equation that I'm showing up, it's science power equals total power minus the thermal. Total power is what we have either on battery or uh, from the solar uh, uh, arrays. But from that, we need to deduct the thermal power. So if we are able to, most, to very correctly predict 
the thermal power to uh, estimate its, its uh, uh, values, we were able to very nicely estimate the power remaining for doing science. And in turn, we are able to better plan which scientific experiment is executed when. This image shows uh, uh, how, how uh, a typical graphs that the thermal power engineer of Mars Express, uh, uh, the, the graphs that the thermal power engineer of Mars Express, uh, Luke Lucas, uh, 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 looks typically at the day uh, when uh, mission planning is taking, taking place. This is historical and some uh, predictions for, uh, for further thermal power consumptions. So what is the problem? Why, why uh, machine learning is needed? Well, the most important is that the old models, they don't fit the new planned operations. First, I mentioned the degraded batteries. They were from the year 2003, now it's 2020. And all the cycles of filling and emptying, filling and emptying, degraded their performance. I mean, uh, the closest uh, uh, comparison is imagine with your uh, cell phones, the more you uh, empty the battery, full em uh, emptying and fulling, it, it becomes less and less uh, uh, efficient. And the other issue is that in 2018, um, they needed to uh, think of a way to navigate Mars Express with very, very, very little uh, support from the gyroscopes because they were uh, having degrading uh, performances. What does this mean when you're flying without a gyroscope? Well, it means that you change everything uh, in terms of how do you fly the, the, the uh, spacecraft. Now, because of, the, uh, because of this, now Mars Express flies upside down in a way, because upside down with respect of the previous style of operation. And the gyroscopes are turned on, turned on only for 10% <clears throat> of the time as compared to previously. These, uh, uh, these implications uh, make uh, the models for thermal power regulation to be uh, uh, to be to become less and less useful. You see, uh, uh, as I said, thermal power regulation and modeling is a like a balancing act. And at this point, after the uh, uh, shutting down of the gyroscopes, it's like ruining all the, the the balance that was set in place. On the image on the right hand side, we show uh, uh, what what has been going on in terms of thermal power consumption when the mode uh, from gyro and to gyro less flight was enacted. On the upper hand, we see the temperature. And then on the lower hand, we see uh, how the, heat, the current through the heaters uh, changed, the, 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 the profile of, uh, of the uh, current through the heaters. We see now that these do not match as the previous uh, uh, experience. This means that uh, this means that uh, new models are needed and better estimates of the ter thermal power uh, consumption. So machine learning to the rescue. Uh, based on all of this, this is a, a very, very challenging problem. And we need to learn a very accurate and robust machine learning models, but not only accurate and robust, but also explainable. Why explainable? Well, because it's needed that the thermal power engineers the, uh, that do the planning to understand what is going on with the thermal system. What, what I'm going to talk about in, this, uh, in the remaining of the talk, first, I will talk about the problem of uh, predicting Max's thermal power consumption. Then I'll talk about quantifying the effects of the gyroless flight. And finally, I will talk about data frugal machine learning that is needed for uh, mission planning. That means to learn good predictive models, even in the cases where the data available is very limited. 
typically when you do mission planning, you don't have the complete information upfront and you need to, uh, to be able to, uh, to plan the, 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 the mission, to, to plan the, the uh, experiments based on these uh, portions of data that has inter, uh, in, uh, iteratively enriched, uh, iteratively enriched. So first, let's talk about the data at hand. On the right hand side, you see Mars Express, Mars Express some, somewhat decomposed. We consider uh, this co context telemetry data that we have from uh, Mars Express. There are these five groups of features. We have solar aspect angles that contain the angles between the sun and the max line and the axis of the uh, max coordinate system. The MOP is a data detailed missions, mission operations plan. Um, it contains the information about the execution of different commands on the subsystems of the uh, satellite, the flight dynamics and pointing events. It contains information about the positioning and pointing of the satellite towards, uh, of the spacecraft towards uh, Earth. So uh, whenever Mars Express is transmitting data towards Earth, it needs to point its antenna towards Earth and all these events are recorded in this type of, this type of data. Then we have a long-term data uh, that is uh, sun, uh, sun, Mars distances and solar constants and other events. Other events are uh, include information when uh, Mars Express was in Mars's shadow, so it's in umbra or penumbra, uh, and where uh, Mars Express is in, in its uh, orbital position. So on one hand, this telemetry data, the context data, serve as descriptive features that describe the, uh, the spacecraft. On the other hand, we have 33 term uh, features for the thermal lines, so 33 heaters, and these are the target. These, the values of these are measured electric current. The, the, for the first study that we did for the thermal power uh, prediction, we had data about uh, two, data about, uh, sorry, three Martian years, uh, or uh, almost six uh, 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 Earth years. And then the goal was to predict the thermal power consumption for one Martian year or two uh, Earth years. The data that we had are at a minute resolution. Most of these are at a minute resolution. So this means that for each minute we have a measurement, especially for uh, measurement for, for the electric currents and we have values for the other features. What we did is uh, we transformed the raw data that is prov as provided by the ESA systems into a tabular form that is typically used in machine learning. This yielded 464 features. And here we, we list uh, three groups, influx, EVOT and FTL, and 33 targets. After that, as I said, the data set is split on train and test. I'm just illustrating what kind of feature engineering we did. This is maybe the most influential uh, set of features that we had. This is energy influx features that use uh, this, the uh, three groups of features that are listed up uh, uh, in, in the title of the slide. So it uses solar aspect angles, a long-term data and uh, the uh, uh, other events. It shows Mars and its uh, uh, coordinate system. And actually this, kind, this type of features measure the amount of energy that the solar arrays, solar panels are getting uh, at, at a given moment. I will not uh, go into details, uh, how is this calculated, but this takes into account also uh, this UT, takes into account the umbras and penumbras of the, uh, uh, of the ma um, max given Mars. So I'll briefly also uh, uh, discuss the machine learning methodology that we used. As I said, we are focused on explainable AI. That means that we want the domain experts 
to understand the models, if possible, or the predictions that the models are making are, are making at a given, uh, for a given uh, set of, of uh, uh, instances. We're working on uh, uh, using um, the predictive clustering paradigm. Namely, we are, uh, focusing with, uh, we are focusing on predictive clustering trees. What are these? Well, these are uh, generalization of decision trees towards structured, structured output prediction. On the right hand side, I'm illustrating just a hypothetical PCT. It looks like an ordinary decision tree. In the internal notes, you have tests on the descriptive attributes with the difference that in the leaves, you have predictions not for one target variable, but for all of them. In this case, for the 33 uh, currents. Technologically, uh, this is achieved, so the ability to, to, to be able to make predictions for multiple targets is achieved through uh, instantiation or adaptation of the heuristic score. Here, instead of considering a simple, uh, 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 the, the, the variance, the impurity of a single uh, uh, variable, we are aggregating the impurities of the 33 variables. Why, why this? is a good idea. Well, by doing this, one can exploit the potential dependency that might exist among the targets. This leads towards uh, prevent, this also contributes towards preventing overfitting. Also, learning a single model for all of the target variables is much, much more efficient as compared to learning uh, one model per each, uh, for each of the target variables. Typically, a single tree doesn't have a premium, a state-of-the-art predictive performance. In order to improve their predictive performance, they are combined into an ensemble. Uh, here, what I'm showing is a random forest of predictive clustering trees. It's similar to, to begging with the difference that random forests use randomized version of the tree induction algorithm. What, uh, what is randomized version? Randomized version is that um, at each node, a random subset of feature is selected and the split is then taken from this subset of features, the best possible split from this subset of, feature, of features. And typically you have the train data, you generate and bootstrap samples. On each of the bootstrap samples, you use the randomized tree uh, algorithm that I described, and then you aggregate the predictions of each of, of these ones to get a single prediction. Draghi, this is Pat Langley. Can I ask a question? Yes. Hi. Hey. Um, so, so I'm glad you set all this up. Can you just? Uh, I'm I'm big on on uh, on understanding why you, how, how you made the design decisions you did. In particular, you chose to view this as a predictive clustering problem rather than say uh, building regression trees, which is one, one, one possibility, right? I mean, you could imagine a, 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 a version of regression trees with multiple regression equations at each terminal node. And the other yes. is, is, is simple equation discovery. Um, is there some reason you believe that say one, Set of equations wouldn't apply to the entire instance space. Is there some reason why you think that equations, even even embedded in trees, would not mm -hmm. uh, give you more power than building uh, just piecewise constant models? Yeah, that is a very nice question. Here uh, we are uh, we are dealing with large amounts of data, and uh, learning the equations in the leaves will uh, present a very high computational burden. And because we are talking about uh, days at the computing infrastructure that we have here at the Institute. And that's why we opted to use this simpler and more efficient variant. We experimented a bit on a smaller scale, but the results were not that encouraging compared to the, what we were getting with the simpler approach. 
now we can i mean uh, uh we also use single target and multi-target so uh, the two uh, the two variants one when you learn a model for each of the uh, targets and a complete model and at a given point the former uh, work better or at the other point the latter work better but in all cases the uh, multi-target variant the simple multi-target variant was much much more computationally efficient and if you need to run series of experiments and uh, it can take lots of lots of time to, to complete them on one hand and on the other hand we are also big on explainability these scores can be uh, these trees as a side effect actually have uh, uh, variable importances. You can easily calculate variant importances and draw nice uh, plots and charts for the domain expert to be able to uh, uh, to understand why the the, the, the model is giving uh, given uh, is making a given prediction. So you're you're talking about it being able to explain a particular prediction, not the model itself being understandable. Is that correct? Yes, these are the two sides of the of the coin. The one is if you have a model explainable, then you have this single tree, and then we can, we we also look at that. But typically, the predictive power of this single tree is not as good as when used in ensembles. And ensembles are not interpretable. We cannot see what is going on. The only way that we can, the one of the ways that we can have a sneak peek is through uh, exploiting feature ranking mechanisms. The other one is to do model selections or uh, regularizations and more complex uh, 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 techniques. But the, the feature ranking in our case proved to be uh, the most successful because we were able to, grow, to draw these very nice donut charts, donut style of graphs that show and illustrate what is uh, going on with the uh, uh, thermal power system of Max. Thank you. And also we used uh, gradient boosting, boosted trees, stochastic uh, variant of it. This is uh, fairly um, uh, adheres to the, to the general paradigm of boosting. You we, uh, based on the data set, we learn a model and then each subsequent model is learned on the residual errors and the predictions are then combined into a single prediction. Uh, this is one of the methods that has been most widely used at uh, competitions and it's, wide, it's known that it also yields state-of-the-art predictive performance. In terms of machine learning tasks, as I, say, uh, as I said, we have uh, the data that consists of descriptive features and we have the 33 targets and one approach is to learn local models. That means we learn a model for each of the target variables, which is illustrated on the left-hand side of this uh, figure that I'm showing. And if you're learning ensembles, that means for each target, uh, you will learn a set of predictive models. On the other hand, we have global uh, models that address global multi-target, that uh, uh, approach the multi-target regression in a global uh, way, where a model is built for all of the targets. In this way, the ensemble consists of the, the ensemble consists of uh, less, much less uh, predictive models. So this is, uh, uh, in general, the, the the machine learning setup setting that we have. Now uh, let's see what what are the results. I'm, I'm just I'll just illustrate uh, some of the results that we obta obtained. Here it's a, a comparison of the performance of local random forests, global random forests, and extreme gradient boosting. On the x-axis, we have the granularity. As you might recall, I said that uh, we have the data at a minute interval, but typically uh, for mission planning, these are, uh, 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 this is very too fine-grained resolution. Uh, we experimented with several of these granularities to, to find the sweet spot. This is mainly uh, uh, to, to, to also uh, reduce the computational load when you need to, to learn this, these models over and over again. We see that the local random forests at the lower 
time resolutions, like less than 10 minutes, 10 minutes or less than 10 minutes, have the best uh, predictive performance. And then at the higher uh, time resolutions, they are matched by the extreme gradient boosting. This means that the global random forests were uh, slightly un uh, were under uh, were uh, the worst performing method in this in this context. In terms of uh, performance head-to-head -head comparison, here I'm illustrating uh, uh, one uh, period selected period uh, from the test set. The red dotted line uh, shows the ESA model that was uh, in use. The green is the real measured value, uh, uh, values, and the blue dotted ones are the predicted values from the machine learning model. We see that this, uh, the, the models catch very nice, uh, fairly nice, very nicely the, uh, uh, the thermal uh, power profile. In terms of practical relevance, the, the, the errors, the discrepancies that we observe are uh, well, well within uh, the, the, the limits that are expected. In terms of understanding what is going on with the spacecraft, I'm showing these graphs uh, that we've drawn. These are uh, graphs that are uh, show, uh, these are donut charts that the, uh, so you, as you see, there are 33 of them, one donut chart per uh, uh, power line. And also for the John, so we have donut charts for the random forest and for the XG boost. For the donut charts on the, uh, with the random forest, we have also all, that means uh, feature importances for the complete, uh, for, for all of the uh, uh, target variables. Uh, we, we, the, the feature importances were calculated based uh, using the Gini tree scoring uh, function. Well, Gini tree actually sums up at each node the variance reduction a given split imposes. So if you have a descriptive variable that in, uh, imposes a very large variance reduction in the output space, in the targets, then this variable gets uh, a higher score. And these are aggregated throughout uh, the ensemble. We see now that this, uh, uh, the features that we have have different effect on different thermal power lines. For instance, on the random forest graph, if we look at the thermal power line 13, we see that there the FTL has a, a non-negligible influence. If we look, for instance, also at 26, we see that it's complete, it's mainly dependent on the influx kind of features. We see also that random forests and XG boosting as models depend on different sets of features. In DXG boosting, the MOPs are uh, by far the most important ones. Now, when we say looking deeper into and pro provide intimate knowledge of the space thermal spacecraft uh, uh, engineer of the, of the spacecraft, uh, we can also, for each of these power lines, drill down and see which variables specifically uh, uh, influence towards the uh, uh, prediction. Now, this is all fine and all the predictive uh, performances that we get are very, very nice and uh, the thermal engineers were very happy. But when the gyroless flight was introduced, then as I said, all the, uh, the board was cleared, smashed up, and then we needed to devise a new plan how these changed operations will uh, uh, affect the thermal prediction models. So the major problem that we had there is lack of training data. This, when we started modeling this, well, it was uh, one, uh, a year ago, uh, the change was fairly fresh. There were not much data to learn from. And then 
while thinking about the problem, we thought of learning a model from the data where when the gyroscopes were uh, active and then try to apply them to the gyroless flight and check how robust they are to this change, whether the predictions that they, they are making still are good and still uh, uh, can support the mission planning. So also on top of these uh, requirements, the model needs to be also accurate, as I said, robust and interpretable. So here we are focusing on the three, the three questions that I, I listed here. Uh, so we are interested in the quality of the predictions given the change, the robustness of the models, and what changed in the thermal consumption profiles of the spacecraft in terms of which parts of the spacecraft are now mostly affected by the changes. The data look the same as the ones that I showed earlier. With the addition now on the lower part here, we have the, the data divided in two periods, the test data divided in two periods, data with gyros and data with gyroless without the gyroscopes. The goal is then to train model, to learn models on the training part and then estimate their performance of the uh, they estimate their performance when the gyros were on and when the gyros were off. The results. In a nutshell, uh, these, these are uh, uh, the overall results that we have obtained. The errors that are shown here are in terms of uh, mean squared error. Uh, we see that when the gyroless, the, in the gyroless uh, flight, when the gyroscopes were off, the performance is slightly worse. That means that something that the models detect that something has have changed. And in the first instance, when we looked at this, we were like slightly uh, uh, disappointed. But when we discussed with the, uh, the thermal engineer with Luke, she said, uh, when converted this in numbers, in real numbers, this, uh, this amounts to a small amount of watts and it's practically, practically for me, these models are uh, equally good. Further, what we did is again, I'm showing uh, the same donut charts that I explained earlier. On the left hand side, we have the donut, donut charts uh, with uh, gyroscopes. And on the right, we had donut charts without the gyroscopes. We see that the profiles have changed. This means that now, the same thermal power thermal lines re rely on different sets of features. For instance, if you look at thermal power eight, when the gyroscopes were on, it it was uh, dependent only on the mostly on the influx and the uh, pointing events FTL. But now, uh, when the gyroscopes were off, it's now dependent more and more on the influx and on the uh, other are the data. To even drill down deeper uh, to get to, to the, these differences, we can take one power line and then draw uh, its uh, uh, importance profile. So on the x-axis, we, um, uh, we are listing all of the features that we had available. Uh, and on the y-axis is the feature importances. The orange ones, the orange bars show the feature importances in the gyro flight and the blue bars in the gyro less flight. We see now that these importances, this, this ordering of the importances has changed. No, so you can note that the importances are ordered by the orange. We see now that this is shuffled around. Most notable are the changes that happen on this writer part where these features for the gyro flight had very uh, low, uh, noticeably lower value values as compared when uh, in the gyroless flights. So we are talking about differences in, in orders of magnitudes. Also, uh, another issue is when you have, when you are doing uh, mission planning, you don't have all of the data uh, available 
at the same time, uh, uh, all of the data available to learn the complete model. You have portions of the data, and these portions of the data are enriched through the iterations of mission planning. Now we're looking at how this frugal data, this data that, is, uh, that has less and less information, can aid in better mission planning. In a sense, whether we can learn robust and good predictive models in this, uh, uh, even in this, uh, uh, in this context. So here we evaluated the performance uh, on three, uh, using three uh, uh, different uh, modeling paradigms, random forests, uh, extreme gradient boosting and uh, neural networks. We also investigate uh, 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 the different parameterizations, different feature spaces, and so forth and so on. The experiments are uh, currently running at our uh, computing infrastructure. And a sneak peek of the results, the initial uh, run that we have show uh, uh, the following. The graph shows the error, uh, uh, error, dis uh, error distributions. On the x-axis we have RMSCs, on the y-axis we have counts. We see that uh, random forests are uh, the best, slightly the, slightly the best compared to the others. Uh, the, the XGB and neural networks are more dependent on the DMOP features. These are the informations about which command was executed when. And the error profiles that we got, we sh show that more or less the models remain robust, which is a very encouraging and very nice uh, result. So what are the take home messages from this? Uh, machine learning models that, that we, uh, uh, that, that were uh, learned are superior to the used, to the domain experts models that were currently, that were used in the, uh, the process of emission planning and thermal power uh, modeling. They're better in terms of accuracy, and also they're better in granularity. The, the domain models work on a more, a bit larger time scale, while these models that we have can work on, on very uh, lower uh, time scales. Machine learning models are robust. That means even when the context switches, we can still have very good predictive performance. This also holds uh, when we have frugal data, when less and less, less information is made available uh, a priori. And finally, that uh, explainability in machine learning, it's very, very important uh, uh, aspect because it was only after we showed the graphs, the explainability graphs to the domain expert, that the real adoption of the developed models started. Before that, you can, uh, the, the, even, even considering even the predictions, the, the, the predictive performance, the good predictive performance uh, was on its own, was not uh, motivation enough for, for the uh, thermal engineers to see that these models indeed, indeed pre uh, provide understanding and knowledge about uh, the thermal system of the space, spacecraft. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this uh, work is developed within the Galaxy Eye project, which is uh, an ESA-funded uh, project. In this image, outlines the general uh, the, the the general workflow that we have there. In each iteration of this cycle of these cycles, uh, in each iteration of this uh, workflow, uh, the experts and the operators are improving the process by improving the feature engineering, by providing feedback, and the models allow for, uh, the, the system allows for kind of a, a what-if analysis in the uh, decision support process, in a sense that um, in mission planning, the operators can uh, play around with the different sets of features, different configurations, and see what will happen with uh, the thermal power consumption. Within Galaxy Eye, we are also uh, uh, modeling the 
exit and entry times of the integral spacecraft, which is uh, orbiting Earth, uh, entry and exit times in the Van Allen belts. But for this, maybe in some other occasion, I can, uh, I can uh, share uh, more details. Why, uh, open science is the way, so we are uh, supporting open science. The methodology that we are developing uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of papers and knowledge, it will be made uh, freely available. The software that we are developing will be made also freely available and the data will also be made available so the community can use the data and maybe the, find um, better, even more uh, uh, interesting ways to, to exploit them. The, 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 the information that I was, uh, the, the most of the work that I presented is published in the, in the papers that I'm showing here, specifically the, uh, uh, the first three, uh, and they are freely available uh, for download. This is the team that works uh, mainly, uh, mainly on this topic, uh, highly motivated uh, young professionals. On the, uh, uh, on the bottom left, we have also Luke Lucas from the European Space Agency, uh, that, uh, that is uh, the thermal power engineer. Uh, I like to thank them all for, for their hard work on this topic. And then uh, this is, this, uh, I would like to acknowledge the support of other uh, people that were involved in different aspects in the thermal power uh, uh, modeling of the MEX spacecraft, especially Sasho and Alessandro. And with that, I would conclude and thank you for your attention. Here you have the, uh, my contact details. Feel free to email me if you want to, to have some information or some resources. Thank you, Draghi. So we cannot, <laughs> okay, I hear some claps in the background. Thanks for the, uh, for the talk. It was nice to hear. Uh, I really don't know much about space research. We are not involved in projects with space, at least I am not. Um, so I would say that if you have any questions, you could either uh, write or you could just uh, unmute uh, and then you unmute yourself and then just ask the question. I see one question at the moment by Luke and I will ask that to drag it, but feel free to, to join after that. So if the hardware is so old, how can you deploy the trained model? No, the, the hardware is old, but the, the models are uh, used in planning that is happening at the ESOC, the operations center in Darmstadt, where they are um, driving the spacecraft. So when they are doing the planning, they are transmitting to the, to the spacecraft only the commands, while selecting the sequence of the commands and the commands themselves, so whether now should uh, the high resolution spectral camera work or the infrareds or uh, what other instrument uh, it needs to be activated. This is decided in the operations center. And then this sequence of commands is transmitted to the spacecraft. No computation is being performed at the spacecraft in terms of uh, this thermal power modeling. Okay, thank you. Luke, are you satisfied with the answer or do you have any follow-up? I assume that's fine. <laughs> okay, Pat Langley, um, I have another question about interpretability, but I can wait until the end. <laughs> no, Pat, it's okay. <laughs> so if you want, you can also join the discussion and ask yourself the question. Yes. Um, so, so I haven't seen the, the, the donut diagrams before and I want to understand better how a, a user, a, a domain user, can use them. In particular, can they look at those and answer a question like, if I increase this variable, what will, what will the effect be on the dependent variable? Does, does it let them make that kind of qualitative inference or not? This, this donut chart, the system that I'm showing, this one, will allow them to do such an inference. Because here, uh, the, the complete systems that we're, we're doing is you can, um, 
look at different variables. You can provide the system with different variables and see what effect they have on the performance. The donut charts are very nice in aggregating and summarizing what's globally going on with the spacecraft. For each of the targets, so this one through 33, um, we see which group of features, so this influx, EVT and EVT and FTL, uh, are groups of several features. And these donut charts in a, nut, in a nutshell show the operator what is being important, what is important for this model. What is the, the cool part is the operators can select subset of instances, sub, 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 uh, you, they can select a time period when something specific happened and they can investigate for that specific time period which features were the most important ones. So not only in terms of targets, you can also select in terms of uh, test instances that you're considering and you can drill down deeper what is going on. And this is, as I said, the donor charts provide uh, a global overview. And also here we show two donor charts that show one uh, situation and the other one. In the case that you were uh, asking, we can draw the donor charts with uh, specific values of given attributes and then another donor charts with these values that are changed. And then we can see how these influenced the overall, these changes influenced the overall uh, thermal power consumption. And then after this is completed, we can drill, drill down deeper and see the importances per feature, per situation and we'll get graphs like this. And here you immediately see that this, uh, uh, the, the, these variables that are on the right-hand side have changed importances. Now they have become much, much more important as compared to earlier. And this process enables the, the domain expert to do exactly what, you, what you've said. They can draw this and then can see, okay, now I've changed this and what changed in my thermal consumption uh, profile. Okay, thank you. And, and are these ways of displaying the relationships, do they, are they dependent on the kind of, of mo learned model you have or would it work with any regression model? They would work with, uh, uh, yeah, if, depends on the scoring function. Now we have three scoring functions. As I said, uh, we used the, the graphs that I showed are with this Gini tree that measures the reduction of variance at each three node. This means that this is related to three methods. However, the second, the second uh, uh, scoring function is uh, the random forest mechanism which is based on permutations of the instances. And in essence, that uh, Bryman's proposal can work at, for any regression model because it takes the, uh, the out, of, out of back samples and uh, permutes them and measures how much the error has uh, degraded because of these permutations. And that permutation happens per attribute per attribute. And that's how you estimate the performances. And this essentially can be drawn for neural networks, for, for whatever type of model. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's late here, so I'm gonna sign off, but thank you for letting thank me you. sit in. Thank you, Pat. Okay, take care, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Pat. -bye. Okay, um, any other questions from the uh, people and the audience, other? Otherwise, somebody? York, <laughs> Kaichi. Okay, otherwise I could ask. I'm just curious. Um, was somebody? There, there's a problem. Uh, there, there is a question in, in, in the chat. Ah, okay. Sorry, I didn't notice. Okay, Luke sorry. Has another. Luke, Luke. Do you want to ask him? What's the ask question? Luke is unmuted, but we don't hear him. Yeah, it's a. Uh, Are they? No, we yeah, don't. I'm here. So, um, yeah, it's just because I, I, I. Um, I don't know too much about space, but I, I watched a couple of like nice net, Netflix like 
videos, right? And then they actually talk about the delay for the transmit the signal is actually quite high, right? I mean, like yeah. it, it, it take like a couple hours, right? For actually transmit the command, right? So yeah. um, I just wondering, like, is it the delay actually um, affect the final yes. decision? Because uh, right? if you think about it, it's, it might, you might better off with a simpler command rather than more complicated one, right? Because uh, what you actually receive is not uh, at the runtime, right? It's actually a couple hours before, right? So yes. that's just yes. the question. So. But Yes, thank you. So how this operates in, in how Max operates is uh, there is no uh, real time, all time connection between Earth and Ma Max. And it operates uh, this, uh, in asynchronous way in a sense that uh, a batch of commands is transmitted there for a period of time which covers the next transmission to Earth. So you have plans for well in advance how the satellite will operate. Most of the conditions that will happen, the trajectories, uh, the orbit, the, the position of the celestial bodies are known and can be calculated. And based on these, the thermal consumption profiles also are estimated. So for a certain uh, uh, period of time, the spacecraft is executing the set of commands that are transmit, transmitted to it. And there is no time for, uh, there is no uh, real need for real time control on this system. So the delay does not cause uh, serious problems with this respect. Uh, hi, just to add. So on average, the, like, the usual time link is around 13 minutes or so. So it's not hours, but it's sort of like in, in minutes. So even though it's not like immediate, it, it doesn't usually have these kind of huge problems. I mean, the, the ones that are flying the spacecrafts are not like flying it live. As Draghi said, they're actually preparing like a set of commands well in advance, like weeks, and this gets approved, I don't know, higher or down the, the hierarchies and then they upload it. So they have a lot of time for these kinds of things. And of course you're right, like in terms of like lengths of commands, uh, but still I don't think it's it's huge problem. It's, it's the, the, the bigger issue they have is like which commands rather than how many commands. So um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. Uh, I was just uh, curious, I mean, this, how often actually you rebuild these models? Do you, there is, because it sounds like you constantly get data, which means that it seems like it's kind of a data stream. So you might yeah. need online learning and something like that. If, if it were deployed on the spacecraft, probably some uh, real time processing from with streams would have been most suitable. However, this is repeated, this relearning of the models should be repeated before uh, mission planning, which happens, uh, let's say, not, not like on daily basis. It's more like on monthly basis, on this scale we are, we are talking. Not like it, you need to have this each hour because mission planning takes time. It, it prepared well in advance, it's month or two in advance. So this, I... this is built pre-trained monthly at, at, the, at the best. So Do you see not... big? Uh, okay, thanks. I understand. Mm -hmm. So basically you have periods. It's not like you have to make decisions immediately because exactly. as you said, everything is in advance. Basically everything is done in batches. In a way, yeah. Yeah, and anything, everything needs to be carefully planned and optimized in, in the sense not to, uh, not to uh, <laughs> destroy the, the spacecraft, but to fully and maximally exploit its potential. Mm -hmm. um, so when you get the new measurements, can you kind of backward work and see like the models that you build, whether maybe another other model that was less accurate previously was more accurate given the new data or something like that? How do you actually very well evaluate what is robustness means in this sense? And 
yeah. it's better on the long run. How do you actually kind of compromise, not compromise, but balance between short-term accuracy and long-term baby benefits? So. In this, uh, that is a very nice question. Um, in this part that I, uh, I was discussing in for mission planning for data frugal, on, on top of the experiments that I mentioned, we're running also that kind of experiments. That means we are varying the amount and the period that we have for train and we're varying uh, and shifting the amount of period that we have for test. So this gives us a very nice overview of what is the sensitivity of the methods uh, in terms of these changes. If so, based on all these uh, uh, experiments that we're doing, we will be able to select the most, how to put this, stable, the most robust model that is insensitive to these changes. But this model will always be the starting point for the, for the mission planning. Always the model will be iteratively improved by the knowledge that they have and by the, by the uh, enrichment of the data that, they, uh, that the operators provide. I see, thank you. Uh, we're almost at around one hour. I, people that, I mean, are welcome to stay for a few more minutes. Otherwise, you could yeah, feel free to leave. <laughs> uh, if nobody else has questions, I don't know. Draghi, how is your time? Are you kind of no, rushing for I your next time. meeting? <laughs> no. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Um, I was wondering, what was actually the baseline model when you start working? You said you had an expert model. How that looked, actually? Yeah, what that was that? Yeah, the baseline model was a uh, domain expert generated. It's a uh, kind of an, uh, it's a, it's an equation at that point. I, I knew it, but now I, I forgot it. It's so it's basically a really mechanistic, like knowledge, yeah, which is physical yeah. and okay. knowledge, knowledge, knowledge based mod, knowledge based uh, equation. And then they provided uh, that was, that worked very well for them at that given time. And then uh, what I, was, I think it was a linear regression model or something like that. Like, I not much, that much. I mean, they, they inputted some knowledge, let's say, in, I don't know, yeah, selecting some of them. But, but okay. Draghi, you should show the, the slide where it, how it looks. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it, the time resolution that it has, it's a mm. bit tricky. But also, what was, uh, as I said, what was convincing uh, one of the, the best. Uh, convincing arguments was when we showed the, the feature importances, the donuts, on top of this performance that now I'm showing. Uh, the domain expert was uh, like, finally, finally the things that I, I, uh, I knew that are going on at the, the, the spacecraft, now I can see them uh, quantified here. Because I knew that this is, these are the changes, for instance, when uh, a given uh, instrument is working now, the, the lower part of the satellite is warmer and it gets the energy from there, uh, from uh, mostly from the influx, for instance. And then she said, I knew that I, I had uh, some kind of a, no, I had knowledge that this is going on, but I was not able to quantify it and show it in this, in this way. And that was the, the, one of the winning arguments. Okay. Nice. I mean, I believe the visualizations, this most donut, the dashboard basically you produced is definitely something that gives them a really nice overview, like top down view, like the, it's amazing. And mm -hmm. then if you can click on each of it and also yes. see which actually features are, I mean, from mm -hmm. machine learning research or data science perspective, I'm just thinking um, the donuts might even look the same, but the features might be different. Yes, because that the donuts- yeah. Yeah, it can happen because the, these are aggregations of these groups of features. Mm -hmm. And as I said, as I showed here, these two, uh, these profiles can be very different, but their aggregations can be, can can be, be the same. Exactly. So I'm just curious, do you also include something or your thinking in your uh, dashboards that you're producing or your visualization or whatever is that API you have there for the people to interact? How would you kind of give also to a different kind of look that summarizes differences maybe or yeah, something along those lines? Yeah, currently we, uh, this is uh, 
the very the, the very nice and uh, uh, pleasing and very uh, uh, visually pleasing and gives a very nice overview interaction with the donut charts will provide uh, drill down uh, and uh, deeper insight into in the uh, power profiles however uh, these kind of aggregations are related to the the, the aggregations that you were mentioning uh, relate to the type of the aggregation itself mm. if this these are sums then i mean you cannot the best way is to somehow also include distributions of the features inside but then the graphs will become i mean it will not be it will not be as uh, it will not provide the bird's eye view that is currently provided yeah that's, that's true and it will be like you are trying to combine these two graphs into a, this one and the donor chart into a single graph and it kind of starts exploding mm, yeah i see and what happened with the uh, deep learning or you had also neural network um, yes, uh, we're running series, uh, executing series of, of series of, of experiments. Preliminary results that we had that show that the performances are on par with the gradient boosting and the random forests. Is there any well, other benefit of using them in this particular case? I mean, I guess we were not we were not able to notice to notice this strong benefit of using them. But you're using the same input as for the other you. You yes. all this pre-engineered. What if you just, is there any need to do the engineering or can you let the- um, Yes, there the, is a need to do the engineering because uh, I didn't show it here. Maybe it, uh, it, the raw files that we get are not, uh, uh, they are uh, raw in the real, <laughs> real sense of the word. They are textual files with uh, commands and they are not uh, AI readable. Mm -hmm. You need to convert them into, AI readable form. And once you convert them, you can use whatever uh, method uh, uh, you want. The neural networks in this case proved, showed to be not much, uh, the, do not go, give as competitive advantage as they give in, in vision or in text. Okay, thank you. Well, I won't uh, massage you more <laughs> with questions other. <laughs> Uh, if somebody else wants to ask, yeah, feel free. Mm. Otherwise, I guess we came to the end of the of this talk. And uh, yes, thanks again, Draghi, uh, Thank you for also. being our first guest. Yeah.